Shalom. So this morning, Ruach HaKodesh placed Matthew 7 and 13, well, 7, 13 and 14 on my heart, which reads, enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. So first and foremost, the gospel of Matthew was written to the Jewish population to emphasize that Yeshua HaMashiach is the Messiah that they were prophesied about. And Matthew actually highlights how he is currently in the process of fulfilling this prophecy. <laughs> how he fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. So Ruach HaKadosh just led me to chapter 6 and chapter 8. He just gave me a summation of what those chapters were about to kind of better help me understand what chapter 7 is talking about. Chapter 6 starts off talking about not to do our good deeds in front of men, but to do them to please God. Then... um he gives us a model prayer, tells us to forgive people their trespasses. So our father will forgive us our trespasses. But if we don't, he won't forgive us. Then it talks about fasting only to be seen of God and not of men. Lay up your treasure in heaven where moth and rust don't destroy. Not on earth where moth and rust do destroy. Then he talks about the lamp of the body being the eye. So basically, wherever you're looking, wherever your treasure is, because that's what he just got finished talking about, wherever your treasure is, whatever your eyes are focused on, if it's not heaven and it's on earth, then your eyes darkness. The subtitle of the next scripture passage says, you can't serve God in riches. This is the New King James Version I'm reading out of. And then he's just talking about you can't serve God in mammon. Then it says, don't worry. And he just says, basically, the rest of the, that chapter is saying, don't worry, I got you. Whatever you need, I got you. Okay. And it's funny because uh, my birthday is tomorrow. I have to have my car registered by my birthday. I already got it done. But earlier this week, I, w I drove the two and a half hours. had to put gas in my car for that to go pay for my registration and then drive the two and a half hours back here and feed my son while I was there because, you know, it's five hours there and back alone. And then I had to go and take care of business. Well, my last paycheck didn't even cover my car note, but I tied. And I just said, you know what? I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do because you've never led me astray, Abba. You've always, you've always provided for me. So I'm just going to trust you. And while I was getting, getting my, well, while I was away to get my car registered, two people blessed me financially. Um, one handed me the cash. The other person cash apped me. Um, neither one of the people did I ask for it. They both came out of nowhere and I was like, wow. So I actually returned with slightly more money, slightly more money than I had before I went down there. But remember I told you my birthday is tomorrow. I need, my car also needs an oil change. I was told yesterday that that's one of my birthday presents. The person's not even paying for the oil change. They're changing my oil for me. And it, and it is somebody that I know knows how to do this. So, Trust me, I'm not just going to be like, oh, yeah, you do it because I ain't trying to catch on fire going down the road. But yeah, so the first time he provided me with the money for me to do it on my own, the second time he just provided me with what I needed. He didn't give me the money to do it. He didn't even have the person pay for it. The person themselves is doing it for me. And I didn't ask them for this. They came to me and said, this is what they're going to do. So I just want you to understand he will provide. Chapter 7 starts off with do not judge. Verses 1 through 6 is talking about how we're not supposed to condemn each other, especially if we are participating in the same. If I'm willfully sinning, notice I'm using the word willfully. If I'm willfully sinning and then I see someone struggling in sin, meaning that they're trying not to sin, but they're still sinning because they're struggling with sin, but I'm willfully sinning. What do I look like telling you that you're going to hell? Now, I can tell you that if you don't, change and turn to him then that's where your outcome will be because that's what he says but I can't send you there you know what I'm saying and he he actually says hypocrites in, in verse 5 it's the same thing that he would say to the Pharisees quite frequently which just means actor you're 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 an actor you're acting righteous and you're not take the plank out of your own eye and then you can see fit to take the plank out of your brother's eye then he talks about asking, seeking, and knocking. No, this is not a prosperity scripture. What he's saying is if you knock on, well, if you ask for forgiveness, seek him out and knock on the gates to his kingdom, he will give that to you. 
Because just like us being evil, give good things to our children, how much more will he give good things to us if we ask for it? If this was about a prosperity preaching, then this would have just contradicted everything he said in chapter six. God is not the author of confusion. He is not contradicting himself. He's simply not talking about earthly treasures. <laughs> He's just talking about, if you ask me for forget, go back to verses 15, um, 14 and 15 in chapter six. If you forgive people their trespasses, so your father in heaven will forgive you your trespasses. Verse 12 says something similar. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them for this is the law and the prophets. So he's literally just reiterating a point. He's not saying that if you ask him for three mansions and <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like that's not what he, that's not what he's saying. I'll leave it there. Then 13 and 14 talks about the narrow way. I read that already. Then verses 15 to 20 is talking about you will know them by their fruits. So he's saying, don't judge a person and condemn them to hell, but you should have discernment. And this is how you, this is how you can discern them. You're not going to discern who they are if they're sent from me, if they are of me by what they're doing, but by what spirit they're operating in, by your fruit. So 1 John chapter 4 actually talks about this as well. Test the spirits to see if they are of God. The Holy Spirit. Um, Galatians 5, 22 to 26 talks about the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, um, self-control, kindness, gentleness. You know what I'm saying? Like there's nine of them. So if that's not the fruit that they're producing, then you know it's another spirit. And realistically, we're supposed to just pray for that person or present them the true gospel. You know what I'm saying? We can warn them, hey, if you don't, you know, turn around, then you're, you're leading, you're, you're, you're actually walking down the broad path. You, you're entering through the, the broad gate is what you can tell them, but you're not supposed to place them in hell. So then 21 to 23, he talks about, I never knew you. So this just reiterate, this is restating that it doesn't matter. This is restating what chapter six is saying, where it talks about doing your good deeds and to be seen of man, where it talks about fasting to be seen of man, where it talks about laying up your treasure on earth, where it talks about not serving God and money. Okay. He's saying that the, there will be people that says, I did all this in your name. He said, I never knew you. You didn't do what I said. I don't know who you are because my sheep know my voice and another's they will not follow. So if you're not following my voice, I don't know you. <laughs> so then he says, build on the rock. Therefore, whoever hears these things of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain descended, the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. So Matthew uh, chapter 16 verses 16 to 18 actually read. Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So he's literally restating this. If you build on the rock, nothing can prevail against what's built on the rock. And he's not saying that Peter is the rock. He's saying He's the rock because he said, I will build my church on this rock. Now, let's look at the nature of Yahuwah. He usually names people after what he's doing or who he is. So, Matiyahu, the gospel that we're, I'm reading right now, Matiyahu actually means gift of God. He is displaying Yeshua HaMashiach as the gift that was promised to the Jewish people and then to the Gentiles. Okay, he is the gift of salvation that we receive from Yahuwah. Yohanan means, which is John the Baptist. Yohanan means Yahweh is gracious. He preached the gospel of repentance unto the grace of Yahuwah, which was given to us through Yeshua HaMashiach and the sacrifice that he made on the cross for the remission of our sins. Yeshua even means Yahweh is salvation. He is our salvation. So let's look at this even further. And I will say to you that you are Peter and on this rock, he's speaking about himself, not Peter. But Peter was who was one of the apostles that he used. Remember Acts 2, the Pentecost? He used Peter to build his church. <laughs> okay. And on this rock, I will build my church. He's the solid foundation. 
So then, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So if you're not building on Yeshua HaMashiach, you're building on something that's earthly, and everything that's earthly will be destroyed. Go to Revelation chapter 8, I mean chapter 14, starting in verse 8. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she was made, she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So we know, and then it says, Then a third angel followed them, saying, With a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on their forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out in full strength into the cup of his indignation. So Babylon in this case would be the sand. If you are building off of Babylon and not off of the rock of salvation, which is Yeshua HaMashiach, then just like this earth shall pass away, so shall you and what you've built. I mean, it's as simple as that. He said, if you don't follow these sayings of mine, he is not preaching prosperity to you. He's telling you that you got to deny yourself, pick up, your, pick up your cross, which is an execution stake and follow him. Okay, then everything in chapter eight is pointing towards having faith in him. Jesus cleanses a leper. Jesus heals the centurion's servant. Peter's mother-in-law healed by Jesus. Many healed at evening. The cost of discipleship to follow him. He even says in this, foxes have holes and birds have air. And uh, No, I'm sorry. Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. His 12, that means... He was homeless and his 12 disciples that were following him laid their heads wherever he laid his head. Wherever he laid his head. That's the cost of discipleship. That means that there are going to be some times where you're not going to have an, any idea where you're going to lay your head, but he's going to provide it for you. There have been times where I've had that. I didn't know where I was going to sleep, but he provided for me. Then the wind and waves obey him. So he's saying that not only should you obey me, but the earth obeys me. <laughs> then he then he casts out um, demons out of a person. That's all of chapter eight. So chapter six is like, yo, don't rely on yourself. Don't rely on uh, the praises of men. Don't do these earthly things. Chapter seven, he's pointing towards do these things instead. Chapter eight, and this is why, because of who I am. All right, so again, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Let me read that last part again, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Difficult is the way which leads to life. Difficult is the way which leads to life. There's, there's nothing, there's nothing about that that sounds easy. Narrow is the gate. The character of Yahuwah shows us that he always pulls out a remnant. He never pulls out the majority. It's a remnant that's going to enter into his kingdom. It is not a lot of people. Now the remnant couldn't be a lot of people in number numerically a lot of people but in comparison to the population of this earth it will be a small portion a remnant of people that enter in the narrow gate from the narrow path all right let me get back to what i'm doing because i gotta get ready for something that i have to have going on but i love you guys perfectly Prayerfully, you understood what this is meaning. Prayerfully, I spoke it out to where you could understand it. If not, please inbox me or comment below. I am open to conversation because we need to talk about these things. All right. I love you guys. Shalom Alaikum.